In this lecture, we're going to be looking at two forms of artwork that are essentially performance-based, performance art and video art, which video art I'm only going to address very briefly. Now, as we've begun our study of modern art, one thing that we've consistently noted is its interest in pushing boundaries, in subverting tradition, in trying to do things with art that had never been done before. And this is something that is quite apparent in the 1960s, which is a climate that can very much be characterized as one of experimentation, which makes for a very fascinating, dynamic, and exciting period for us to study. Performance art stems from this desire to find new and innovative ways to express oneself, where artists began to create brief, temporary works of art that incorporated elements of drama, dance, poetry, now in this description, I'll say it once again, artists begin to create brief temporary works that incorporate elements of dance, drama, poetry. In this description, the most important word to note is temporary, temporary. Generally, the only thing that is left after a performance art piece are the photographs or videos or whatever else was used to document the event. And keep in mind that these documents are not considered the work of art. They're just documenting what happened. The artwork itself is the performance. When the performance is over, the work technically no longer exists. Now, this alone is a paradigm shift. Aside from Duchamp's foray into early conceptualism, Art has pretty much always been considered in terms of the object, this precious tangible object that lasted into perpetuity. But now we have the immediacy and ephemeral nature of performance, and even perhaps a complication in regards to interpretation. How can we truly interpret a performance piece if we have not seen it in person? If we are only considering the work after the fact, looking only at its documentation. For example, we have the performance piece Dark Light by Marina Abramovic and Ule, who had a, what seems to me, very intense, passionate, long-term relationship. And they also created what, in my mind, are some very, very profound collaborative performance pieces. In this piece, Abramovic and Ule kneel across from one another and undertake a physical and emotional exchange where they take turns slapping each other until one of them decides to end this back and forth. Now think about this. Think about what it would be like to witness this, to hear silence punctuated by slaps. Sure, we could hear this on a video, but perhaps the video wouldn't pick up on more imperceptible sounds such as the intake of breath before delivering or receiving a slap, or the nuance of light and shadow, a formal element of such importance that it is referred to in the title. And we wouldn't be in the room when this is actually occurring. So we wouldn't be contextualizing this performance, for example, within the reaction of the audience, which we would be a part of. And performance is a singular event. It cannot be recreated. Even if we were to watch a video of this piece, if it was performed again, and it was, it was performed twice, it would be completely different. The slaps would be different. The duration of the performance would be different. The audience reaction would be different. So as you can get a sense here, and this is true for most all performance art, the main goal is to make highly temporary works of art the function to break down the boundaries that exist between art and life, the boundaries between art and lived personal experience. And in many ways, that is what light dark is all about. Not just the literal breaking down of boundaries that I've just described, but a conceptual breaking down of boundaries by highlighting the limiting binaries that we use in order to um, comp compartmentalize our understanding of the world around us. It's not just light and dark. Think about it. It's male, female, plain, pain, pleasure, silence, sound. And it is this performance that invites us to investigate that gray area in between. Now, one more thing. 
While performance art emerges in the 1960s, it was a term that really began to regularly be used in the 1970s. However, this is not the first time we are ever seeing in the entire history of art this idea of performance as part of the visual arts. Remember this guy? That's right, it's our lobster chef, Hugo Ball from the Dada period of the early 1900s. The groundbreaking legacy of his work is living on here. With the more modern conception of performance art, there's a lot going on. There is a lot of variety to its approach regarding the possibilities as to what can constitute performance art, and that was very much the point. Keep in mind that Dada was very much against the rational categorization of art styles. And with so much eclecticism here with the 1970s performance art we're looking at in this online lecture, it's easy for performance art to defy these sort of neat and tidy confines of the style that factor in so prominently to the structuring of art history. So performance art is definitely living on, not just in concept of performance, but also in this Dada rejection of style as an ordering, structuring, characterization of um, movements within the history of art. More on this point to come. Let's start with a type of performance art known as happenings which became popular in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Happenings were loosely staged public events of all descriptions that were organized by artists. And this type of performance art was invented by Alan Capro, whose uh, work or the documentation of his work we are seeing here. These happenings were hybrid events. They were part visual arts, part performance, part chance or improvisation, part audience direct participation, right? And that last part's very important, audience direct participation. Now with this approach, and I've already kind of mentioned this in the introduction, the authority of the art object is being subverted, where you go from one piece, an object, communicating a single artistic intention to a collective construction of meaning. What I mean by that is that the meaning is not only determined by the artist, but the audience is also determining the meaning as well. And it's a meaning that is constructed almost entirely on chance, right? And that word chance should be ringing some bells. I don't know about you, but that reminds me a lot of Dada, right? Chance. Because Capro can't predict what the audience is going to do, he can't predict their reaction, their participation, and that, their reaction, the, the method of their participation, that is what helps to create the meaning of the piece. Now let's consider how this works by looking at Capro's 18 happenings in six parts, which occurred at the Rubin Gallery in New York over a span of 90 minutes. The gallery was divided into separate rooms and performers within each space would go and they would do things like they'd paint paintings, play music, show slides, or recite fragments of speech, which seems very Hugo Ball and his sound poems, by the way. While all of this was happening in each room, the audience is totally immersed in the art, where again, life and art are completely intersecting, and Capro has deconstructed the boundaries that lie between the two. Now I wanna reiterate, in this, we can see the conceptual facet of performance art, where again, art is no longer object-based. There isn't even an object involved at all, really, but art is rather an action, it's a concept. Now to talk about performance art and to talk about its beginnings in Dada, I think it's important to also locate this within the context of Neo-Dada, Neo-Dada which was a 1950s art movement looking at social reality without any sort of controversial intention. So as a style known as Neo-Dada, there's obviously gonna be some links with the earlier style of Dada. Both are operating in war climates. Do you remember Dada? World War I, right? Neo-Dada, the Cold War. Now Dada, as we know, was openly critical of the war. 
Neo Dada is doing the same. It's also critical, but in a very discreet, almost tangential way. Critiquing the facets of society and culture that contribute to war, but not necessarily directly war, right? The things that cause the war is what they're really looking at. And this includes things like economic competition, for example, which relates to things such as consumerism. Both are antagonistic to the authority of tradition and institutions, both performance art, or excuse me, both Dada and Neo Dada, antagonist to the authority of tradition and institutions. And this includes art institutions, such as the art market, art schools, art credits, etc. And that's again why probably we're seeing this rejection of these neat and tidy categorizations of, of what constitutes style. One of the big differences between Dada and Neo Dada was that Neo Dada placed more importance on the viewer. Essentially, the viewer's interpretation informed the meaning of the work, not so much the artist's intent. All right, super exciting and interesting. Let's look at some more things. Yeah, here we go. Remember this, IKB 79, right? The amazing one of 200 monochromatic paintings that we saw by Yves Klein. Guess what? He incorporates this lovely, deep, rich blue into performance art. For this event, Klein invited about 100 members of the Paris art world to watch him direct nude female models, who he referred to as, and I quote, living paintbrushes. He covered them in his patented blue paint as they pressed themselves against large sheets of paper. It was his attempt to spiritualize the flesh, to project onto the bodies of these women the notions of the infinite, the pure, to conjure up a manifestation of otherwise imperceptible cosmic energies. All of these things are concepts that, as we know, his blue paint embodied. Now, while the women were doing this, and you can see it over in here, back in here, while the women were doing this, the musicians played what Klein called monotone silent symphony. This was a piece of music he wrote himself. The alternation of 20 minutes of the musicians playing the exact same single note uninterrupted, followed by 20 minutes of silence. Imagine what that would sound like uh, listening to. I interpret it as the silence being this equivalent to the purity of the blue tone. Like, please stop playing this annoying one note for 20 minutes. The silence sounds amazing. So again, you've got that emphasis on sound that is not too different than what Abravovic and Ule were doing in their light, dark performance. Now, as an aside, can I just weigh in for a moment as a feminist art historian? I do love Yves Klein's work, you know that, but there are some aspects of this work that don't sit super well with me. This work is problematic in a way because it takes the bodies of these women and uses them as a site upon which to project his concepts. And that removes their identity and agency. Something that's certainly reinforced by the idea that he's telling them, directing them what to do. He also removes their identity, their personhood, again, reducing them down to objecthood as a tool to be used by the artists by referring to them as living paintbrushes. That's just my little aside. Now here's another thing I wanna tell you about. A little fun fact. Klein was also a judo expert, studied judo in Japan. He was so good at it, he actually wrote a book about the martial art, which is still considered to be a standard text for practitioners today. Now, while this is a certainly fun fact about Yves Klein, I'm not just randomly mentioning it for funsies. I've read more than one work by an art historian who has argued that his experiences with judo actually informed his work. This idea that two people in a judo match are not viewed as opponents, but rather collaborators. And in terms of the work here, that that may have been inspired by impressions left on the body after it fell onto, a, onto the mat during a judo match. Now at this point, there needs to be an important point of clarification. We have performance art, and we have a type of performance art known as happenings. Now the two are definitely related, 
but, and this is important to note, they're not one and the same. What is the difference? Okay, Happenings require direct viewer involvement. They're actually involved in the piece. They're helping to actually construe the piece's meaning. With performance art, and this is an example here, the viewers are passive observers. Here they are in the back, they're just watching. They're not the ones that are actually on the paper um, making the, the impressions of the body, right? So performance art, the audience watches. Happenings, the audience actually participates. Let's look at some more examples. How about meet joy? Now my introduction of feminist concepts as applied to performance art in the previous slide is actually a pretty relevant point and we should consider it further because feminist artists found a particular resonance with performance art for a number of reasons. First, it was more or less a new form of art making, one that was without the masculine associ associations that were already well entrenched within the more traditional approaches to art. So it allowed for female artists the opportunity to distance themselves from the art of their male predecessors, working with a new art medium. Second, performance art relies specifically on the body, which was perceived by female artists not just simply as a sort of cultural battleground, which is evident in my feminist critique of Yves Klein's work, but also the body is a visible marker of what it meant to identify as female. And it also is a comment on the implications of such an identification. The performance artist Carolee Schneeman made what she called kinetic theater, which was a mix of improvised movements and a variety of materials. Most of her performances examine the relationship between actual experience and the imagination. And most of, the, most of the performances address the erotic and the taboo while encouraging sexual assertion for women. That women should be open, confident in their expression of their sexuality. Now in this 1964 performance, Meet Joy, which was performed multiple times in London, Paris, and New York, Schneeman and other participants reveled in the taste, the smell, the feel, of raw fish, plucked chickens, and uncooked sausages. They were semi-nude and they rolled around with the meat, and there was some paint thrown in there as well, rubbing it all over one another's bodies. While performing this act, the people were celebrating the flesh, both the human flesh and the raw meat, where the sensuous movements represented indulgences in the flesh and a celebration of the carnal, while also acknowledging the flesh as part of our material world. And this is something that's relegated against the necessity, the need to consume both eating and sex. With rolling around with the dead raw flesh of animals, it was intended to be a ritual of, of eroticism where the participants moved between movements of ecstasy, passion, and animalism. The physical contact of the semi-nude bodies as a transmitter of these energies. Love it. Now let me just describe, and I'm gonna use Schneeman's own words. She can say it better than I can. Here's what Schneeman says about it. Meat joy has the character of an erotic rite, excessive, indulgent, a celebration of flesh as material, raw fish, chickens, sausages, wet paint, transparent plastic, rope, brushes, scrap paper. Its propulsion is towards the ecstatic, shifting and turning between tenderness, wilderness, precision, abandon, qualities which could at any moment be sensual, comic, joyous, repellent. So epic. All right. Let's move on to cut piece. In Yoko Ono's 1964 cut piece, we see art based on a concept and on an action that occurred in a moment in time. In this work, Ono sat on the floor, staring straight ahead, not making eye contact with anyone in a sort of meditative trance-like state. She wore her best clothing and had a pair of scissors that was placed in front of her. The work involved members of the audience coming up to her 
and cutting away pieces of her clothing, and they got to decide what to cut and how much. And this continued until Ona was down to her undergarments, and she did have the chance to decide when to stop the piece. In the process of cutting away her clothing, the viewer stands at a very close proximity, perhaps even at times touching her body. So that yet again, we have this blurring of boundaries, this time the traditional boundary between the artist and the viewer, where the viewer is not interacting with the art object, which in some ways was the stand-in for the artist, but rather the object is absent and it is direct interaction between artist and viewer, and that's mediated by the concept of the piece, not the art object. Once again, the connection between conceptualism and performance art becomes clear. Now, this work has been read by many as making a feminist statement, one that comments on sexual violence against women, as Ono's clothing is literally being cut from her body in ways that she cannot directly control. It's also about voyeurism, you know, perhaps getting sexual pleasure from observation. And it's also about female vulnerability, her eventual nudity representing that vulnerability. And while we had Schneeman's words to help us understand Meet Joy, Ono has provided conflicting recounts, accounts regarding what this piece is intended to comment on. I've read interviews where she does admit a feminist intent along the lines of what I've outlined uh, just above, this commentary on sexual violence. But I've also read occasions where she's linked this piece to her Japanese heritage, particularly as it relates to Buddhism, where Buddha sat under a tree, meditative and unmoving, much like how Ono is seen here, as a means to achieve enlightenment. He stripped away all the material possessions to live a life of detachment, a stripping away that is both figuratively and literally occurring here with the cutting away of clothes. Now, speaking of the Buddha, let's take a look at this piece. Now, while this is probably not ideal, I'm just gonna cover one work of video art, but I'm picking the best of the best, the pioneer, perhaps even the father of video art, Korean artist Nam Joon Paik. At the advent of photography, it could not initially capture motion, and the desire to capture motion in photography created the uh, eventual uh, development of motion picture. And motion picture was invented at the end of the 19th century. So not too far after the advent of photography itself. The moving motion picture was um, made from sequences of rap rapidly exposed photos. And artists were quick to begin to use the motion picture as an art medium in many different ways. Although we don't see the full potential of video art really being realized until the 1960s, when much of the technology needed for this art media became more widely available and more importantly, affordable to artists. One of the first artists to work with video in a modern sense was Nam June Paik. And with this work, we have an installation in which it's a sculpture of the Buddha, who's contemplating his own image on a futuristic style television that to me looks kind of like an astronaut's helmet. Or, the viewer could perhaps see it as the video camera contemplating the Buddha, or they could comp contemplate each other simultaneously. Either way, the camera and its hookup to the television are in full view, for Paik wants us to be aware of the entire mechanism of this relationship, where past and future confront one another, as do the religion and secular entertainment. With the overwhelming popularity of the television after its introduction in the 1920s, perhaps Paik is saying that television has become the new icon of worship with mass media, the new religion. As the viewer moves around the work, they temporarily appear on the screen as they stand behind the statue. The temporary presence of the viewer contrasting with the external eternal existence of the Buddha and the stare of the camera. We are asked to assess our place within this meeting of the sacred and profane. The brief presence of the viewer creates a sense of immediacy that is not too distinct from the sense of immediacy that is also a feature of performance art. In both cases, there is a consideration of the passage of time and things like movement, space, and sound. 
All of these things are made manifest in ways that traditional media, media such as painting, sculpture, and drawing, couldn't quite rival. And that brings us full circle, right? This idea of looking at new ways to express, ways that other traditional forms of art uh, couldn't quite do uh, in this way. So good.